Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Regina LaBelle. I'm the director of the Addiction and Public Policy Initiative at the O'Neill Institute at Georgetown Law. And um, I'm going to um, turn this over soon to my colleagues to speak. But first, I want to talk a little bit about um, what we do at the Addiction and Public Policy Initiative, as well as about the master's program that we have at Georgetown's graduate school. And then also, um, you know, we've had an overwhelming supply, a, a number of people who are interested in today's webinar. And so I think this shows um, the importance of the issue. And so I want to talk about why we're why we're conducting this type of webinar. And um, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Madison, Greg, Donna, and Lissa to talk about the you know the complexity of this issue and how important it is. Uh, so first, I'm going to start by um, saying a little bit about um, about our um, sorry. My apologies. I just tried this. There you go. So I'm the, uh, as I mentioned, the director of the Addiction and Public Policy Initiative, and we work at the intersection of the law and public health to advance evidence-based practices. And our work really spans um, uh, topics like this, the ADA and recovery housing, the ADA and medications for opioid use disorder, as well as the Fair Housing Act. And also we do work on fiscal redesign, how to more effectively uh, engage people in the opioid litigation uh, proceeds process, what ethics should look like in that regard. Uh, we have a number of different issues that we work on and they're really all meant to advance effective policies to address today's addiction issues. Um, our staff is, um, you know, we have a, a lean staff, but they are incredibly proficient and able to get information out on a number of topics. Shelly Weissman is our, um, our project director, our deputy. Joey Longley is a senior associate. David Sinkman is a senior associate. They both work on litigation uh, and civil legal issues. And then Madison Fields is our uh, fellow who I'm gonna be turning this over to shortly. Cody Thompson just joined us as a program coordinator. We also have the Master of Science in Addiction Policy and Practice program. This is a one year program that's the first of its kind in the country. It's a 30 credit program. And the purpose of this program is to train and educate future addiction policy leaders. Uh, we've had, through, this is our third cohort. The first two cohorts, individuals are employed at every level of government in nonprofit organizations and are already making a difference in the field of addiction policy. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Fair Housing Act. Now, these are, are issues that uh, don't get a lot of attention in the substance use space, uh, but that's why we have uh, individuals today who are expert in this issue who are going to talk about how federal laws can be used to advance best practices in recovery housing. You know, we know how um, tragic the situation is in this country with over 100,000 overdose deaths. But we also are, are growing in an understanding of the social determinants of health, how they not only lead to adverse outcomes with substance use disorder, but also social determinants of health can help people sustain recovery. And that includes housing. And so that's why we're talking about this today. Um, Donna Dimitrovic is going to talk about SAMHSA's new best practices on housing. And she's going to go into additional detail on this really um, important piece of work that was recently released by SAMHSA. One area that I want to draw uh, folks' attention to is a, a piece of legislation, model legislation, that LAPA put out last year, in 20, uh, two years ago, in 2021, and it's a Model Recovery Residence Certification Act. So this is model state legislation. Uh, the state of Delaware recently adopted it. 
And it provides for a certification program in the state of Delaware that helps to advance evidence-based practices in recovery housing. We have a lot of materials that we've put out. Every We have journal articles that we just released, one on, uh, on the importance of recovery-ready workplaces. All of this you can find, our fact sheets, quick takes, all of this you can find uh, using this QR code. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Madison Fields, who is going to be um, MC for today's um, webinar. Madison has been a fellow with us for a little over a year now. She is a graduate of Elon University School of Law, and she recently wrote the Ethics and Opioid Litigation Proceeds Quick Take that we just released. Um, Madison also has worked um, at when she was in law school, worked with the ACLU and the Innocence Project. Um, so I'm really pleased to have Madison here today uh, to MC our event. Thanks. Thank you, Regina. Um, my name is Madison. Um, I'm grateful to be here with such an impressive group. We have Donna Dimitrovic, a senior advisor in the Office of Recovery at SAMHSA. Greg Dorchak, Assistant United States Attorney in the Civil Rights Unit at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Massachusetts, and Lissa Franklin, founder of Lissa Franklin and Associates. We will begin with presentations from our panelists. Following the panel, we will have a discussion before wrapping up with an audience Q&A. Please submit your questions for panelists to, um, to answer at the end of the program. So first, we have Donna Dimitrovic. Thank you, Madison. Okay. Can you see my screen? I just wanna make sure before I get started. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, really is um, a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about the work that we're doing at SAMHSA uh, around recovery housing. Um, I just want to mention that, you know, we have this disclaimer here that the views, opinions, and content uh, do not necessarily reflect uh, the Office of Recovery, SAMHSA, uh, or the U.S. Department of um, Health and Human Services. Um, as Madison said, my name is Donna Dimitrovic. I have the honor of serving as a senior advisor in the Office of Recovery. I'm a woman in long-term recovery. I've been working in the field for uh, a long time, about 35 years now, <laughs> uh, primarily uh, working on um, policy and program uh, efforts across the country. Uh, for the first thing I'd like to do is really talk about uh, some of the work that we're doing at SAMHSA, review our uh, priorities, as well as give you a little snapshot about the Office of Recovery. And then I'll get into the report that we recently released around recovery housing. So, um, you know, uh, for those of you that are not aware, uh, just recently, at the end of September, for the very first time, we were able to share some data on recovery um, that was in, uh, we gathered from the NISDA report. Uh, it really uh, was kind of historic and groundbreaking because it's the very first time that we were able to do that. Um, and, you know, of that data that we found that two in three adults who had a mental health issue considered themselves to be in recovery or recovering, as well as seven in 10 adults who has who had identified as having a substance use problem uh, also considered themselves to be in recovery. And if you're interested in that, certainly you can go to our website uh, and download that report. I also wanted to highlight SAMHSA's priorities and core principles. As many of you know, we recently uh, put out our new strategic plan. Um, and really the, the Biden and Harris administration reaffirmed the commitment to addressing the nation's mental health and substance use crisis. Um, we've really seen unprecedented resources and comprehensive strategies to address both. And um, here on this slide, just want to highlight SAMHSA's five priorities. We had a public comment and revised some of the priorities into the five that we show here. We've added mental health, services to our suicide prevention priority and added preventing substance use to the priority of preventing overdose. We kept the remaining three priorities to promote resiliency in children, youth, and families, integrating behavioral and physical health care, and strengthening, of course, the behavioral health workforce. And we'll continue to work to incorporate what we call our four core principles 
equity trauma-informed approaches, com commitment to data, evidence and evidence, and uh, our underlying principle of recovery. It really is our vision at SAMHSA to ensure every individual who needs care, regardless of who they are, where they live, their ability to pay, can find it uh, when and where they need it. And while we're continuing progress, we really do have a lot of work to do. So I just wanted to talk about uh, the Office of Recovery, our working definition of recovery. Um, as many of you know, it is uh, a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live self-directed lives, and strive to reach their full potential. In August of 2021, SAMHSA hosted our, um, um, I'm sorry, August of 2022, we, all, we hosted our very first recovery summit, um, probably in well close to a decade. Uh, and we brought together stakeholders and folks from across the country uh, as well as our federal partners to really talk about um, the issues that are that are being seen across the country relative to recovery. Um, and you know, as we had those conversations, we kind of, you know, reviewed our SAMHSA working definition of recovery, and it really was reaffirmed by the folks that were there, which, you know, I, I think um, just, you know, goes to show that it's broad enough to apply to everyone, but yet, um, uh, can be used for uh, groups all across the country. Um, as we build out our national recovery agenda, we really, our main purpose is really to focus um, and support all people and communities that are impacted by mental health and substance use conditions to be, to pursue recovery, be resilient and achieve wellness. And this is really just the first step as we have conversations over the next several years. I wanted to add that uh, as part of the definition of recovery, uh, SAMHSA also included the four dimensions of recovery, which is really integral to supporting an individual's journey. And I, I also want to say that it's not, this was not SAMHSA per se, it was like stakeholders and folks from all across the country that were really involved in these conversations. We really value the voice of folks with lived experience and feel it's important because at the end of the day, um, you all are, are the people that know what's happening on the ground. Um, and so we strive to really listen to what you're telling us so that we can move forward with the work that we're doing within SAMHSA. But I just wanted to highlight these four dimensions of recovery. Uh, the first one being health, which is really about managing one's disease or symptoms. For example, it could be abstinence from alcohol or other drug use. Uh, or, you know, and making informed, healthy choices that support physical and emotional well-being. Uh, the second one is around purpose, having meaningful daily activities, such as a job, volunteer work, uh, creative endeavors. And I know for me, you know, as a woman in recovery and early recovery, that was one of the first things um, I set out to do, or um, uh, I should say was also highly suggested that I get back into the workforce and start to do things that were meaningful as well as volunteering and helping other people. Um, community is about having uh, relationships, social networks that really support, uh, provide support, friendship, love, and uh, I believe um, uh, uh, the most important is hope. And then what we're talking about today, having a safe and stable place to live, um, you know, having a home or or somewhere where you can go that helps to support your recovery. Just a little bit about our Office of Recovery. Um, it really does build on the long history of SAMHSA supporting recovery. Um, you know, I got involved in this work and back back in 1998, and SAMHSA was at the forefront of supporting recovery uh, community organizations as well as um, you know. Um, helping to provide a voice to people that were in recovery as well as family members and allies. And so, you know, in September of 2021, we announced our assistant secretary announced the very first office of Rec recovery, which is really inclusive of both mental health and substance use disorders. Um, and I already talked a little bit about the national summit that we had in August of 2022, but then we um, formalized our uh, office in September of 2022, where, where we were able to actually hire folks to come in to the office and help build out our uh, goals and national recovery agenda. 
Um, this office, right now we have 11 people that are hired within the Office of Recovery, and all of us identify as having lived experience either as somebody um, with um, substance use disorder, mental health recovery, or a family member. Um, I just wanted to uh, also uh, provide our uh, aim and purpose. Uh, really, the whole purpose of our Office of Recovery is to advance recovery across the nation. Uh, and we plan to do that and are doing that by forging partnerships to support all people, families, and communities impacted by mental health and substance use uh, to really pursue recovery, build resilience, and achieve wellness. These are our five goals that we identified. Uh, very briefly, I'll touch on these five recovery goals um, and all the activities that they do that we do within this Office of Recovery uh, really focuses on these goals. And the first one is inclusion, meaning that we really want to ensure meaningful involvement of people with lived experience and to improve the behavioral health practice and policy uh, to foster the social inclusion of people with behavioral health conditions. Our second one is equity, uh, increasing opportunities for recovery, especially in underserved and under-resourced populations and communities, which includes people of color, youth, older adults, LGBTQI+, rural veterans, and people with disabilities. Our third goal is really to provide uh, and expand peer services in every community across the country. Number four is social determinants, addressing key social determinants that support recovery, uh, which really does include access to housing. Number five is wellness, uh, expanding holistic self-care strategies to improve health and behavioral health outcomes across the full continuum. So we look at prevention, harm reduction, treatment, crisis care, and recovery support services. And I'd also like to mention that our principles include, include data and evidence to support our work, making sure that we embed trauma-informed practices in all our recovery efforts and rights protection, including the human and civil rights of people with lived experience. So now I'll just get into um, our best practices for, for recovery housing. Um, as uh, Regina mentioned in September of this year, we um, put out our uh, new updated best practices for recovery housing. Um, and it was announced by the Assistant Secretary and it is now available on our website. So the reason that we reviewed and looked at this was, you know, as part of the omnibus, there was some language in there to really um, clarify the role of SAMHSA in promoting the availability of high quality recovery housing. And so we looked at uh, working and collaborating with stakeholders and focusing on um, uh, our, our, re our prior report or our prior uh, guidance um, and looking at how we could really focus on uh, recovery housing to the extent that it is um, um, not really uh, looking at clinical treatment, but actually the social model of recovery housing. And so, you know, part of the omnibus really required um, to develop and periodically update uh, best practices for operating, promoting the availability of high quality recovery housing. So in 2018, there was some, uh, there was a support legislation that defined recovery housing as a shared living environment free from alcohol and illicit drug use um, and centered upon peer supports and connection to services that promote sustained recovery. Uh, as I said, we updated this. We know that recovery housing is an intervention that is considered a recovery support services and really specifically designed to address the person's need for safe and healthy living environment while also being able to provide any recovery and peer supports that a person may need. Um, all of SAMHSA's treatment and recovery grants support the use of recovery housing as well as the block grants to use funding. Um, and we support and promote the certification of recovery housing through the uh, NAR, National Association of Recovery Residences. It's also, um, that is um, uh, within this best practices recovery housing report, as well as Oxford Houses. Um, and really it's about ensuring recovery housing, uh, houses adhere to and promote the use of evidence-based practices. Um, and 
as I go through some of our uh, some of these best practices, it really is to provide an overarching framework to an, improve and extend foundational policy and practice for recovery housing. And our hope is that it provides the greatest support for recovery, also for safety and quality of life for individuals that live within a recovery house. So the very first, um, uh, you know, and I, I want to reiterate that as we develop these best practices, we worked with stakeholders, um, you know, and reviewed and re-reviewed and went through uh, our leadership to really get uh, to the uh, best possible best practices for recovery houses across the country. And so the very first one uh, we developed was to be recovery um, centered. And as I talked about our recovery definition, uh, you know, being recovery centered is really embracing the four dimensions that I discussed earlier. Uh, and also it, you know, there should be an opportunity for folks uh, within a recovery house to also get the assistance that they need for maybe mental health or medical issues, occupational uh, help that they need, family, legal, or other social needs. Um, and, you know, I think the other thing that we don't think about is that when people, people can be in a recovery house um, in early recovery, so maybe, you know, with several days, 30 days, whatever in recovery, but also I, you know, I know folks that live in a recovery house that may have 10 years of recovery. So, you know, thinking about that in terms of, you know, having availability of having those support services for people that may be in early recovery, but also, uh, you know, maybe um, in, in later uh, sustained recovery and also the availability to build on people's social and recovery capital. So our best practice number two is really looking at promoting um, person-centered individual and strength-based approaches. Um, you know, embracing the philosophy of social model, people really should have the choice um, and the level of support that they need when they go into a recovery house. And, and this is what we mean by uh, promoting person-centered. So some things to consider when determining appropriate settings. And I know there may be some people that refer that are on this webinar right now that refer folks to uh, recovery houses. And these are some of the things that you may want to think about. So, you know, standards, um, that the recovery house uh, has, maybe their culture, the level of support, where the recovery house is located, um, living environment, maybe the, the current uh, residents that are there. You know, do, does the recovery house embrace the use of medication? Uh, we know that's important, uh, especially for, for those of us in uh, recovery from opioid use disorder that, you know, folks may need medication. And is that embraced? And is it elevated within that uh, the culture of the house, you know, staff training, professionalism for higher levels of care, you know, what about ethics, rights protection, recurrence of use policy and availability of overdose um, reversal medication. But, you know, not only uh, does it make sense to have, you know, person-centered, individualized, and strength-based approaches, but also making sure that people that are coming into the recovery house understand the policies and procedures that you have in place um, and, and being able to, um, you know, explain that to them is really important. Uh, our best practice number three is incorporating the principles as a social model. You know, is there a, a culture of recovery within the recovery house? You know, does it promote peer-to-peer -peer connections, provide a sober, supportive environment, you know, and look at it in a way that, you know, we don't, necessarily have a treatment plan. So there's not that clinical piece uh, that goes with the recovery house, but but actually a recovery plan where people are, um, you know, encouraged to develop their own plan of recovery moving forward. Uh, does the community have a nurturing, safe, unconditional uh, openness and really build upon, upon the trust uh, and grounded in kindness. You know, I mean, when you look at the social model, really, you want to make sure that people are are, are um, uh, actually welcome within the environment of where they're going to live. Our best practice number four is to pro, uh, promote equity and ensure cultural competence. I think this speaks to itself. Uh, you know, does the house and is the house responsive and respective of respect, respectful of people's needs? 
Is there a sense of community and culturally competent folk um, um, support within that living environment? Uh, and really, you know, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do uh, is really help a resident restore healthy relationships and also promote equity within all the work that is being done there. Um, best practice number five is really to ensure quality, integrity, uh, resident safety, and reject patient brokering. Um, you know, consequences can happen as a result of unethical practices. Myself and a, a few of my staff were. Uh, our staff in the Office of Recovery were talking, the colleagues were talking yesterday about some unethical practices that we have come across, you know, in, in our experience in working. Um, and so, you know, not everyone knows that um, this could occur. Um, I was talking about um, uh, a friend of mine that uh, I helped his daughter get into treatment. And when she got into treatment, you know, there were people looking for, um, for him to actually to remortgage his house to pay for treatment. So there's some, you know, uh, and if you don't know that, you might think that's a <laughs> that's a practice that that is out there. And we're hoping by putting these best practices out here that there are these standards that that uh, organizations can live by. And so you know, the de it, it decreases uh, quality of care. You know, there's higher overdose rates. There's re incentives to keep residents in active use which is, goes against the grain that, you know, what we're trying to do is really help support people on their recovery journey. Uh, you know, the not in my backyard attitude, we already deal with plenty of stigma and discrimination uh, a, as a result of that, um, you know, being uh, not ha having unethical practices within these recovery houses, you know, really just adds to that. Um, you know, and it also can all, uh, um, increase rates for insurance plans and private insurances, uh, pulling out of some certain uh, state marketplaces. And so, you know, the, those are things that you wanna think about uh, it, to really be um, ethical and uh, follow some of these guidelines. Number six is really to integrate co-occurring and trauma-informed approaches. Uh, SAMHSA has a new practice guide for implementing trauma-informed approach, which is available on our website. And while recovery houses may be specific to substance use disorders, many all of us also have co-occurring disorders. And it's really important that leadership and staff within the recovery house uh, uh, have that and within their policies and procedures should really reflect uh, not only trauma-informed, but also co-occurring approaches um, as they're working with people. Number seven is to establish a clear operational definition. Um, recovery houses are safe, healthy, family-like, substance-free living environments that support individuals in recovery from addiction. Uh, and while recovery residents can vary in stru structure, you know, all can, uh, not all, but most are centered on peer support connection. So the fact that folks that are living within the, the recovery house have that peer support uh, and also connection to services that promote long-term recovery. And then number eight is really to, uh, to establish and share written policies, procedures, and residents' expectations. Um, you know, it also provides, an, uh, and within this report, we highlight, you know, freedom from abuse and neglect, forced or coerced labor, privacy of persons' physical health and behavioral health records, freedom to manage persons' own finances, to have family supports and also the freedom from unethical patient brokers. And I think, you know, most importantly, um, informing residents of their rights, including a process to submit and resolve uh, grievances, uh, to me would be, you know, at the top of the list because I think that a lot of people, uh, especially those new in recovery, don't necessarily believe they have that. Um, and, and I don't want to say, you know, uh, it really, it really is just being able to. Uh, be an advocate for yourself. Um, and if you have that and understand that when you go into a recovery house, you know, and you feel like um, your rights are being infringed upon, you know, you have this process that you can follow, um, you know, that will definitely, hopefully go to your lead, to the leadership of the recovery house. Number nine is the importance of certification. 
um, you know, really certification ensures that the home meets uh, organizational, phys fiscal, operational property and recovery support standards. And the culture is also important to consider when determining recovery housing. Um, SAMHSA really recommends the home be conducive to sustaining recovery with supports such as, you know, um, does the house or the home structure reflect community living? To what degree is it recovery oriented? Are staff respecting the peers? Um, is the community viewed as a resource? And does accountability uh, involve the peers or the residents? And what actions and practices have shared social um, uh, meaning and support? So those are some of the things that uh, we recommend uh, when you look at uh, certification. I know NAR and Oxford House have standards and we look to them as kind of like the, you know, um, the golden standard you know, um, uh, of what's happening out there across the country. Best practice number 10 is promoting the use of evidence-based practices. Um, you know, uh, several practices can complement recovery housing, um, offering resources to help residents access and support recovery. And I talked about that a little bit earlier, uh, including the access to healthcare, employment, social services, um, and not have any barriers to restrictions for those that are using prescribed medications. Um, you know, uh, uh, most house recovery houses don't have direct support, um, you know, counseling therapy right within the recovery house. However, uh, being able to refer people to a higher level of care if they need that uh, is appropriate. The other thing, um, you know, we mentioned within the best practices is around medication. Um, you know, what are the practices of the recovery house as far as us, utilizing maybe locked boxes, uh, having in, ensure that staff and residents are properly trained, and then um, you know having proper documentation if, if that is necessarily. And then you know also I think it, it's really important to facilitate open discussion of medication use within the community itself in the recovery house. So how do we? How does the recovery house? Um, manage those conversations because, uh, you know, there's still a lot of stigma and discrimination. And so having uh, open discussions about that and leader that comes from leadership at the top, as well as people that are living within the recovery house. And then best practice number 11 is really evaluating the program effectiveness. Um, you know, I know, especially in my uh, prior positions running a community-based organization, it's kind of like the last thing you ever do because you're so busy helping to support people. But it's, uh, you know, it really helps to gauge the effectiveness of the services that you're providing um, and also helps to support requests for, you know, any state or federal funding that you may be looking at. Um, you know, you could look at resident satisfaction surveys it really can be a valuable indicator for overall performance of the recovery house um, and you know, lead to modifications if there's necessary, if it's necessarily necessary. So those are the um, very quickly the best practices that we have um, within this report. Some of the other things I just wanted to mention that we're doing. Uh, here at SAMHSA's, we're hosting and uh, we hosted an intersection of recovery housing and housing first models. So we brought together stakeholders to really have a conversation around um, funding strategies, especially for recovery houses and then housing first models. Um, the report is right now under review, and we're hoping to post that within our web on our website. Um, and then, you know, we are currently collaborating with our other offices, the Office of Recovery, yes, with our other offices and centers within SAMHSA to look at what we're doing across the board around recovery housing. And then we are going to um, uh, host an interagency work group uh, to look at uh, recovery housing and ensure uh, what other agencies are doing around recovery housing to really collaborate, to look at quality recovery housing policy and programming um, across um, all over the federal government. And so thank you for the opportunity to talk about this today. Um, and I will pass it back to Madison.
Thank you, Donna. And thank you for teeing up the conversation and framing recovery for us and identifying recovery housing best practices to support sustained recovery. Next, we have Greg Dorchak. Hey, everyone. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, which there's always that awkward transmission between saying you're doing it and doing it. And hopefully we made it there. Um, so I am located in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Massachusetts, uh, uh, but I've been sitting at a place where we've been working on these issues out of Massachusetts since 2018, and uh, that has given us kind of uh, a, a big picture view of how these issues look. Um, and so I'm going to talk about situations that, that apply to the, the country more broadly. Um, and I'm going to talk about disability rights protections generally first, before I dump, jump into its protections for addiction. So federal disability rights laws protect individuals with disabilities from discriminatory treatment when that treatment is based on disabilities. Um, I'll talk about what a definition of a disability is uh, a little bit more deeply, but it's very broad and it's a disability is a physical or mental impairment that affects one or more major life functions. And we'll get into more of the specifics of that, but that's the overarching framing, framework that we're working with. Now, this, this gen, these general rights apply in approximately five situations, uh, probably more, but I'm gonna talk about places of employment, state or local governments, places of public accommodation, recipients of federal funds, and then dwellings. Now, breaking those down, we have three different statutes that we're really talking about here. So, and I saw there was a question in the chat about whether the Americans with Disabilities Act or the Fair Housing Act are, are more or, or less protective than one another. And I think what we're talking about here is where the statutes apply. So the Americans with Disabilities Act is going to apply to the first three locations. So employers have to comply with the ADA, state or local governments have to comply with the ADA, and then places of public accommodation, which are essentially places that do business with the public, they also have to comply with the ADA. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act is what extends these protections to any recipient of federal funds. So let's say um, uh, an, a recipient of a SAMHSA grant, for example, they receive SAMHSA money, um, they have to comply with Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. And then what we're really focused on here is the Fair Housing Act, which is going to cover dwellings. And I'll talk about what that addresses um, uh, in a little bit, but just know that when we're talking about recovery housing, and this is because I'm a lawyer, I'm gonna have to say that very, you know, it all depends on the facts of the situation, but it the Fair Housing Act or the Americans with Disabilities Act could really apply to what we cover as a, a recovery home or a sober home. You know, you have to look at the type of services offered to see whether or not it also receives um, protections under the ADA. But generally speaking, all sober homes are going to have to comply with the Fair Housing Act and all of the provisions of the Fair Housing Act. Now, going back to that definition of disability, when Congress decided that a disability is a physical or mental impairment that affects one or more major life functions, they provided another number of examples in that. And of those examples, it was very clear drug addiction and alcoholism were included as examples. So right away, we know that people with addiction are protected as people with a disability under the ADA, under the Fair Housing Act, and under Section 504. Now, when we talk about that notion of dwelling and whether or not the Fair Housing Act applies, dwelling means really any building which is occupied as a residence by one or more families. And here, a family includes a single individual. So if somebody is really renting out a property, renting out a unit, um, if somebody is making a real estate transaction, these are all entities 
that are covered by the Fair Housing Act because we're talking about dwellings. But that means that sober homes, by whatever name they choose to be called, and I think there are so, we all know that there are so many different different names that we could be using here, whether or not it's residential recovery home, recovery housing, sober living facility, uh, transitional facility, even halfway houses, these are all going to be covered as dwellings, or likely going to be covered as dwellings under the Fair Housing Act. And that is regardless, I, I know that there are some misconceptions um, that might come up, regardless of whether they receive federal funds, their dwellings and must comply with the Fair Housing Act. Now, when we're talking about and the, the real area that I'm going to be focusing on today is barriers for people with medication for opioid use disorder, barriers for MOUD, um, we have to take a kind of step back here and talk about what disability is. Now, there's no real broad category of disability so that, you know, everybody with one particular diagnosis is all treated in a particular way. Rather, disability rights law recognizes that each individual's disability is different. And so the protections that one person receives are very different than the protections that another person receives, even though they might be, broadly speaking, having the same diagnosis, medical diagnosis of a condition. So barriers created for treatment, because treatment is inherently linked to a particular person's individual disability, when there are barriers for a treatment, those barriers can't be disentangled from disability. And what does this mean? So I'm going to talk a little bit about a court case. And actually, I believe one of the attorneys, um, Sally Friedman, um, I, I, I'll give a little shout out to Sally Friedman, because I think she is a participant um, watching today, but this is one of her cases. And this is a very important case when we're talking about, uh, when we're talking about disability rights law in terms of barriers to treatment. So this is a case called Doe v. Deer Mountain Day Camp Incorporated. And this is about a basketball camp uh, for, for uh, children uh, and a child with HIV wanted to go to that basketball camp. And the basketball camp said, we will not be accommodating you. Um, and the basketball camp used a number of reasons as to why they were not going to accommodate the, the individual. But one of the things that they said was, it's not the person's HIV status that we have an issue with. It's actually the, the uh, side effects of the medication the, use, the person uses to treat that HIV. So it's not the diagnosis, it's this medication. The court said, even assuming the truth of the defendant's allegations, however, the fact that Adam may take medications with certain side effects is inseparable from the fact that Adam is HIV positive. Discriminating against Adam because of the medicinal side effects, therefore, still constitutes discrimination on the basis of Adam's disability. So here we're really talking about if you are creating this barrier, or if there's a barrier that exists for somebody's treatment, because everybody needs an individualized assessment as to what that particular person needs for treatment, when we see barriers to a particular person's treatment, we therefore see barriers to the disability. And those barriers are protected by the ADA. And what does this mean? Courts have routinely found that barriers to medications for opioid use disorder violate disability rights statutes. So I'm going to uh, throw suggestions to a number of cases that have been litigated. So Pesci v. Coppinger, Smith v. Arusta County, and MC, MC v. Jefferson County um, out of the Northern District of New York. These are three court cases where somebody was seeking, or not seeking, but somebody was going to enter a jail or a prison. Um, and the jail or prison had various limitations on providing medications for opioid use disorder. It might have had, in the case of Smith v. Arusta County out of Maine, it might have had we don't provide anybody any of their medications for opioid use disorder. So no methadone, no buprenorphine, no injectable naltrexone would be provided in that particular facility. The court said, 
that actually is not providing an individualized assessment because there's no real reason as to no, no real clinical reason, no real medical reason. It's just this administrative policy um, that really does affect individuals with disability. When you provide medications for every single other um, condition in that setting. In Pesci v. Coppinger, it was a little bit different. Uh, in Pesci v. Coppinger, they had this policy where everybody with opioid use disorder receives one medication. That medication is injectable naltrexone. So we have this policy of we know how to treat this use disorder and we always use this particular medication. Now the court said, that's not the way disability rights law works. You have to have this individualized analysis because what, and as we know in recovery, you know, there are various pathways to recovery. What is needed for one particular person might not be the same efficacy for another individual. Um, the law protects that. And the law protects that in ensuring access to the, the medication when that diagnosis exists. Now, DOJ, um, which is where I work in the Department of Justice, we've engaged in a number of enforcement acts, actions for similar policies. Now, these have occurred in jails, in prisons, in uh, court systems. So uh, whether or not it's a trial court system, um, I, in Massachusetts, have a settlement agreement with the state of Massachusetts uh, for their trial court system because there was a practice where uh, various judges would say, you know, we have an abstinence only policy as we've come through here. And that abstinence only policy did not allow individuals um, to be continued on their medications going through the court system. We found that to be a violation of, of the statute and Massachusetts has since adopted a very, very, um, uh, I think a good policy where they ensure review of any potential decision right away. Um, in my colleagues in Pennsylvania that are currently engaged in litigation against the Pennsylvania state court system for similar, similar allegations. Um, nursing facilities, nursing homes would have policies where they would not admit or allow admissions of patients who were, again, prescribed buprenorphine or methadone into their various facilities. Um, and likewise, hospitals and surgeons, um, DOJ is engaged in enforcement actions uh, when hospitals and surgeons would refuse to provide treatment. So again, while, while these are not talking about housing systems, the analysis is the same. The law is very similar. What we're talking about, though, is dwellings. And when dwellings have policies and practices that uh, deny access to people because they might be on a specific medication for opioid use disorder, even if they're allowing other people with opioid use disorder into their facility, the law protects the individualized access. And the individualized access requires looking at what any individual person's treatment requires. And that very well might be a medication for opioid use disorder. Now, I know that there was a question in the chat about whether or not for abstinence only houses that that would um, be a fundamental alteration and, and so uh, would be a fundamental alteration and be protected by the law. I don't want to get into the specifics of any particular case because whether or not something is or isn't a, um, a fundamental alteration requires looking at a wide variety and number of specific factors. But broadly speaking, broadly speaking, uh, the courts tend to rely on looking at access and in ensuring access. And that's how the courts uh, have, have defined what a fundamental alteration looks like. Um, and, and when I mean access, I mean ensuring that there is uh, access for medication for opioid use disorder. Um, so it would require a bit of, and I know I'm playing the lawyer game of not necessarily answering the specific question because it would require looking at specific facts, but just know that the courts have uh, broadly construed this to allow and ensure access. Um, putting it all together. Sober home settings that have policies denying admissions to people because those people are prescribed particular medication for OUD could violate federal civil rights statutes. And all three 
federal civil rights statutes that I talked about today could be implicated here. It could be the Fair Housing Act. It could also be the Americans with Disabilities Act, depending on the facts, whether or not the place is considered a public accommodation under the ADA. And finally, if the recipient is receiving federal grant money, um, it could be liable under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Before I turn it over, I do want to give one other plug regarding these statutes, and I think it's an important thing to talk about here, and that's sexual exploitation in housing. So under the Fair Housing Act, landlords, and this includes sober home operators, cannot demand sexual favors uh, in exchange for rent or other privileges, even when this conduct does not rise to be criminal. It falls under the Fair Housing Act. We in DOJ have seen a number of these issues coming up in silver homes, and generally the individuals or people don't necessarily recognize that this falls under the Fair Housing Act. Given that we're talking about recovery home settings, I think it's important to at least put this on people's radar as something that does occur in silver homes and in recovery home settings. So finally, I have a QR code here for DOJ's opioid guidance. Um, we received, released guidance on this issue, broadly speaking, uh, in, I believe it was 2022. You can access it here. It's a lovely PDF. My email is there. Um, I'm happy to field questions, uh, which I think we'll get to through the chat, but also you can please reach out to me for follow-up questions. And with that, I'm going to hopefully stop sharing my screen and turn it back to everybody else. Thank you, Greg, and thank you for identifying protections under both the ADA and Fair Housing Act and how they are applicable to recovery homes. Last but not least, we have Lissa Franklin. Thank you, Is it working now? Okay, good. <laughs> um, so I am going to talk about how access to a recovery residence helped save my life, helped me obtain a life of purpose, and helped me also obtain a voice for the voiceless. This is a little disclaimer that I must and always do. Um, I'm not a law enforcement. I'm not a lawyer. I am not a federal agent. Me being involved with local task forces as a civilian does not give me any special privileges or investigative authority. This presentation is not legal advice. Please see bullet one. This presentation is also my own words, not that of any organization I'm affiliated with or involved with. Um, this presentation is also not sponsored by any county or city or state. Um, I'm gonna start with my story, talk about how I'm an Iowa original and how I got to Florida. Then I'll jump into where we were in Florida and why we jumped into action. We'll recognize the aspects of some of the predatory practices that we saw, um, how we recognize the lack of proper treatment and recovery supports, the infrastructure and protections and the social determinants of health that were needed. Um, what we did, how we categorized the systematic gaps and needs of current legislative tools, communication and collaboration, and what we can do moving forward and what we are doing right now by continually constructing um, to implement a solution-focused plan of action to protect those seeking access to safe and supportive housing while also reducing their barriers towards successful acquisition. Um, so treatment and recovery saved my life, which is why I fight so hard to protect it. Um, growing up, I, I had an awesome childhood. Um, just like everybody else, um, I had a mom and a dad. They're still happily married. I actually think they're 
participants on this webinar. Um, I have <laughs> two younger brothers. Uh, they're not so little though anymore. They're both going to be 30 next week. Um, and uh, I was always, I was always academically gifted. I was always athletically inclined. I had anything I could ever need emotionally, financially. I just, I just always felt different. Um, as you can see by two, <laughs> two of the pictures I found at my parents' house last Christmas. Um, clearly, my life was headed towards a certain direction. Um, fast forward to around middle school, I ingested my first substance. Then throughout years of use, um, I suffered all the consequences, the legal, the financial, the social, the relational. Um, and I was so broken. I didn't even realize who I was anymore. And I knew I needed help. Um, so after I had experienced an academic disruption, um, Colorado State was like, you know, the 1.2 is not really working out for you. You got to go. I was like, dang it. So I went back to Iowa. Um, I had heard about uh, 12 step meetings through movies and such. So I went to alcoholicsanonymous.com to find a meeting in my area. And I didn't know this at the time, but alcoholicsanonymous.com was actually owned by a treatment center. Um, alcoholicsanonymous.org is the one that is owned by the 12 step fellowship that we are all familiar with. Um, so I got to Florida um, through a series of events. It was once I was down here, I was like, you know, I've waited my whole life to get to Miami. Why am I coming down to Florida to kick an alcohol and cocaine habit? This is like my dream come true. But Actually doing cocaine and alcohol in Miami is not like the movie Scarface. Um, and I hit my bottom pretty quickly. Um, I was able to find a wonderful facility um, and get out of the experience that I had been brought down to. Um, and as soon as I made recovery, my life is when I truly began to live. Um, what really catapulted me to that is I had access to safe and supportive housing. Um, I can accredit it anything that I have in my life today to my sober living experience. Um, it was in my sober living environment where I got the courage to go back to school, where I learned how to apply for FAFSA again, um, where I applied for my first jobs. It's where I graduated my first college. Um, it's where I got to volunteer with a bunch of my housemates. And then through that, got involved in various other advocacy organizations. And really um, at the beginning of this presentation, uh, when Donna was talking about how there's people who are 10 years in recovery and they still live in recovery homes, I probably would never have moved out of the recovery home had <laughs> they not sold the home. I had such a positive experience. Um, it was almost like growing a second family and that was the love and support that I needed at that time. Um, so for where we were with the regulations and for what was happening in Florida, there were a lot of problems. People were dying. There were little access to evidence-based care. People were dying. People were exploring, trying to get help. People were dying. There were all hands on deck that were needed and only some were coming um, and people were dying. That was the biggest issue. We knew that there were three buckets that we needed to tackle and we needed to tackle them at the state, the county and at city levels. What people thought the problem was, was the state of Florida. I've heard the Florida shuffle, um, but reality, what the problem was with unscrupulous physicians and rogue sober home operators was the lack of regulations and standards within substance use treatment care and their operations was the lack of enforcement of those regulations and standards, was lack of communication between jurisdictions and licensing agencies. There was no legitimate universal resource for people seeking help to verify legitimacy and quality of providers um, and the language and the portrayal by the media. So I'm gonna kind of breeze through this for time. Um, I will send the PowerPoint. All these are click through links, so you can click through to the specific bills, resources mentioned, et cetera. Um, I'll go to what we did, solution focused. So for the state, um, as Al mentioned in the chat box, um, 
we adopted the recovery residence standards through the state. Um, we delegated the Florida Association of Recovery Residents as the essentially delegated authority for um, overseeing and accrediting or certifying these recovery homes. Um, the Florida Association of Recovery Residents is an annex of the National Association of Recovery Residences. Um, through the Palm Beach County Sober Home Task Force, which is now the State Attorney Addiction Recovery Task Force, we drafted and implemented um, House Bill 807, and that was a bill that addressed patient brokering, treatment marketing, recovery residences, standards of clinical care. We also helped draft and pass House Bill 21, which deals with um, prescribing. We got the Public Health Emergency Declaration implemented, and we also implemented the Naloxone Standing Order. At the county, we had the Palm Beach County State Attorney Addiction Recovery Task Force. We have Rebel Recovery. We have the Recovery Community Organizations. We have the Healthcare District. We have the Homeless Outreach Team, and we have our Housing Ordinances. And what's so special about the Palm Beach County State Addiction Recovery Task Force is that the name Task Force is kind of off-putting, and it sounds very enforcement-oriented. But it is the State Attorney's Office. Um, it is the Florida Association of Recovery Residences. It is the Florida Certification Board. It is Floridians for Recovery. It is the National Association of Addiction Treatment Providers. It is almost any and all community stakeholders um, locally at the state level and even some federally that have a hand in implementing solutions and protections um, to increase access to care and support recovery. Um, which is why all of this is so successful. And what's really the, what was the most important thing that I think we've done is specifically as a city in Delray Beach, um, is we've treated recovery as an illness, not a badness. Um, we have the Delray Beach Drug Task Force, which is a 501c3. And through that, we recognize that we were having a large increase um, back in 2015, um, of overdoses and something we were experiencing or noticing is that the same people that were experiencing non-fatal overdoses were having reoccurrence of overdose sometimes even in the same day and what was happening is they would um, experience a non-fatal overdose they would be served by fire rescue or the police department and it's kind of like see you later have a nice day so through the drug task force we implemented a program through the police department called Delray Beach Cares which was hiring of Ariana Ciancio. She is a non-sworn civilian employee of the police department. She is a licensed mental health clinician. And what she would do is she would go and assess every person that experiences a non-fatal overdose and link them to the appropriate services that they are willing to accept. And if even if they don't want anything at that time, even just a hug and a list of resources. Um, and within that first year, there was a 79% reduction in overdoses um, citywide. We also um, communicate diligently with code enforcement. Um, and going back to the illness, not a badness, um, it's very special that the city of Delray Beach has their code enforcement officers who are um, as compassionate as they are. And they do treat us like people, um, not problems. And they're very keen on recognizing if a home is doing what it's supposed to and supporting the recovery of its residences versus causing harm or operating unscrupulously. In order to achieve what we did with code enforcement, we brought down Daniel Lauber from planning and communications firm in Chicago, and he did a needs-based study um, on our zoning laws. And him and Terrell Pyburn, who was the special counsel at the time for the city of Delray Beach, and she's the current city of Coconut Creek, um, took the findings from that zoning study, and they crafted a new zoning um, ordinance for the city of Delray Beach that has since been multiplied across municipalities across the state and the nation. Um, it passed in July of 2017. It became a FAR requirement um, April 1st of 2018 in Delray. Um, 
And what that means basically now is if you want to be a sort if you want to own a recovery residence, own an operator recovery residence in the city of Delray Beach, you must be FAR certified in order to do so. Where we are now, um, we are currently in the midst of updating current legislation um, through loopholes we didn't see, um, caveats we didn't foresee, um, you know, different trends that we also didn't foresee, or drafting and passing new protections for MOUD. Um, I think the great thing about recovery is that it is as individual and unique as the person it belongs to. But unfortunately, that also makes drafting legislation and protections incredibly challenging. Um, I am hopeful because where there is a will, there is a way. But what we don't want to do is make something so difficult that it's too difficult for the providers to operate. Um, but we also don't want to make it in a situation where we're putting the residents at harm or putting responsibilities on them that they shouldn't otherwise have. For instance, um, the dispensing of Suboxone, um, should that be dispensed by the certified recovery um, residence administrator? Should that be held by the person in a lockbox? Should it be kept off site? Those are all um, those are all accommodations and stuff we're trying to work towards and find a solution with. Um, where we go from here, we do want to see federally unified licensing requirements and categories. Um, additionally, the states implementing and enforcing their own. Um, we would like to see insurance companies come to the table. Um, similar to what Al mentioned in the chat box, um, parity enforcement and payment models similar to the evidence-based long-term care um, aftercare models that we see with assisted living facilities or orthopedic rehabs, because that is just as much part of the care access to housing um, for the substance use recovery as anything else. We're going to need communication between agencies, states, municipalities, and each other, um, and collaboration. Because if you do have conversations with me, you will not ever be able to have one where you don't hear me say teamwork makes it, oh, here, I even have it. Teamwork makes the dream work, um, because I do. I believe it with my whole heart. Um, nothing great was ever accomplished alone, but we can definitely do it together. Um, so if you are in this training, you are committed to a solution. If you see something, say something and take every opportunity to educate others. You can start a task force. You can engage your associates, colleagues, and community. Um, you can empower people by equipping them, their families, and their affiliates with the knowledge of best practices. You can increase the legislative safety supports to ensure quality care and force protections put in place to sustain recovery. And then I do have resources. Um, when you get the PowerPoint, if you want to click through, all of these are click through links. So even this will take you to the FARS page so you can get there. And that's it. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you for sharing your own experience and how that's motivated you to help others and also just being instrumental to the efforts in Florida. Um, and now we will have a brief discussion before returning to questions from the audience. Again, please submit any questions through the Q&A feature for panelists to answer at the end. We'll get to as many as we can, um, but this uh, webinar is also being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, I believe uh, the speakers have also put contact information in their slides for um, direct questions. So first, I'm gonna start with Lissa. Um, given that recovery, uh, that the recovery process isn't linear, and there may be a recurrence, what policies should be put into place to make sure we're addressing this reality? What would a regulatory framework look like? I think, um, I think even just describing it as a reoccurrence is instead of a relapse is a major step forward um, as far as stigma reduction, because stigma reduction is going to be the bulldozer we need to be successful with crafting new compassionate housing policies and amending the current ones. Um, while like anyone who needs affordable housing assistance faces a long process due to scarce resources, um, 
people in our arena with substance use disorder, they face additional barriers. Um, you know, there's the statutory requirements that pose limits, um, like the HUD, living in HUD buildings for people who have past drug related activities. Um, so, you know, that poses a barrier that we need to look at um, and like adjusting those, um, but also, if a person is just exiting inpatient care um, or their substance use disorder caused them to lose employment, housing assistance can help them stay connected to um, the housing and the services support they need to stabilize their life. Um, so the flexible housing funding, you know, that would allow communities to create a true community continuum of housing options. Um, and it will also incentivize programs to work together so that no one falls through the the gaps. Um, the regulatory framework, I think, would need to be needs based and community specific, um, because what will work for one municipality might not work for um, another. I do think all the stakeholders need to be involved, you know, such as NAR, HUD, SAMHSA, and DCP, HHS, DOH. Um, and we'll all need to harness patience and resilience because it will take trial and error to find the most sustainable and person-supportive solution for each community. Thank you, thank you, that's great. And, and Donna, in addition to safe and stable housing, many recovery homes include additional supports to help sustain recovery. This may include assistance in finding employment or hosting group and individual behavioral therapy. Which social supports do you find most effective and which should be prioritized? Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, looking at all social supports, I don't think anyone is probably better than the other. Uh, and looking at it as a person centered. So what does the individual need? What are what what does that person need to be successful? And maybe for one person, it may be finding a job, you know, and helping to support them to get to find a job or um, their uh you know, it may be reconnecting with the family or, um, you know, so I think being able to have any and all resources available within that community to help people that are in your recovery house is really important. I, you know, I know for me, when I got into early recovery, it was about, you know, finding a job and getting reconnected with my family. Those were the two most important. But for others, you know, it may be, you know, getting some medical issues taken care of. Um, maybe going to a federally qualified health clinic in the community. So uh, just having those lists of resources, I think, is really uh, important. And having, you know, I, of course, am a strong believer in peer support. And I think being able to, um, you know, have, uh, you know, the experience of somebody else that kind of walked that path is really important. Thank you. And we've talked a lot today about the role that housing can play in sustaining recovery and how important that is. Greg, can you speak to the consequences of denial of housing based on MOUD? Um, having to choose between MOUD and housing, individuals often elect to not use MOUD if it means they'll have accessible housing, um, which can be catastrophic to their recovery. So can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, absolutely. So we have actually, there have been cases where, um, and we have we have learned of cases where people would be told, you know, we we are with our admission practices, you can't be here on buprenorphine, you can't be here on methadone. So the person, uh, through non-clinical reasoning, decides to taper off of their medication. That has sometimes led to overdose. Uh, and sometimes led to fatal overdose. Uh, these these are the kinds of consequences that denial of of um, that that you know what we consider discriminatory policies could could lead to um, consequences for an offender. Uh, generally, when we bring cases under these laws, and when private persons bring cases under these laws. They're seeking two different things. The first is injunctive relief. So stop this practice from happening. When DOG, DOJ brings a case, we bring a pay, case to stop the practice from happening and to get better policies and procedures on the ground. That's generally the very first and foremost concern. 
The second is, depending on the specific facts, there may be damages. In the example that a person does wean themselves off and has a, um, a you know, poor health outcome as a result, you know, that could require compensation. So these are the kinds of things that we we look at when making a determination over, you know, what we seek in an enforcement, but primarily um, compliance is DOJ's number one goal. Thank you. Um, Lissa, in your presentation, you, you ended with teamwork makes the dream work. Um, you were instrumental, like I said, in the efforts in Florida. How did you bring people along to make the changes that were needed to advance the recovery housing community? Um, it was literally like a grab and go type snowball initiative. It wasn't planned and it wasn't, it was meeting people through various city commission meetings, um, family advocacy groups, parent support groups. Um, the state attorney's office was very, um, they were very welcoming and they listened and then they convened a bunch of people together and then it was word of mouth and we all just we all just came together and you know it's it's being open about it um because at this point somebody knows someone who is affected by the addiction epidemic in the united states whether they're in they're currently struggling or they're in recovery um and a lot of people want to get involved. They just don't. They just don't know how to. Um, so it wasn't wasn't difficult at all to find people who are wanting to get involved and help and make changes. It was just the talking about it to get people riled up. Well, that, that's exciting to hear and motivating. Um, and then before we turn to the Q and A, I just want to ask. Um, I think Lissa and Donna can both speak to this. Recovery homes have taken many shapes and forms and vary across states and counties today to meet the needs of their specific community. How do you best balance integrating best practices and standards while still making sure they're reflective of the community and are community centered? So I'll just say that, you know, as SAMHSA put out the best practices for recovery housing, you know, it's uh, to be used as a framework, understanding that every state is different and some states may have certification processes already in place. Uh, I think some states are also licensing recovery homes. Um, you know, so everyone is different and, and really, um, you know, listening, my recommendation would be listening to the community and uh, what is needed within the community. And like Lisa said, word of mouth spreads, right? You know, so, I live in Florida. I, I also hear things about recovery homes or, you know, what's the good house? What's, you know, what place would you refer someone to? Where would you not refer someone? So, you know, just being able to um, understand what's happening within your community is important. Um, and, you know, having the availability of this best practices, my hope is that, you know, folks across the country can, I mean, it's, you know, read this, this, this report and kind of use it as a framework when they're looking for or setting up recovery houses uh, that, you know, these would be best practices to follow. Yeah, I would agree with that um, because I would definitely agree with that because what works in one area is not going to work in another. Like what works in Delray is not going to work where I'm from in Des Moines. Um, even something as specific as Florida, what works in Delray isn't going to work in some place as remote as Ocala. Um, and all communities are different and they have different populations that need served, um, especially like even uh, the young adult population is entirely different than the 55 plus, which is entirely different than um, somebody re-entering society after a um, stay with in the justice system. Um, so it's it's a community-based needs assessment. Thank you. Um, and now for our audience uh, Q and A. 
Uh, we'll start with Greg. Can you speak to how zoning is implicated by the Fair Housing Act? Um, for example, zoning these facilities out of certain neighborhoods and issues like that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, zoning under the both the Fair Housing Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act is implicated here. And there are a number of cases where, um, where uh, towns have attempted exclusionary zoning practices that try to keep out recovery homes, treatment centers, other, other instances. And, uh, you know, depending on the facts, I'll, I'll give an example. This is um, in, it's a, it's a treatment center. So the town of Lynn, Massachusetts, had instilled a zoning practice that no treatment center could be located within X number of feet from a school. And X was such that there was no location in the city that met that requirement. Um, the court found that to be a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and these are the analyses that, that happen. You have to look at whether or not there's an actual legitimate reason for a particular practice, whether or not um, the, the zoning board needs to make a reasonable accommodation for people with disabilities. Um, but courts have found that these zoning practices could be violations. Thank you. Um, Donna, how can someone, uh, how do you encourage compliance with the best practices that you put out? Um, you know, I, it really does follow uh, NAR and Oxford Health standards. Um, you know, a lot of that is um, referenced within the document. Um, and I, you know, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, we want people to be able to have a safe um, place to live. Um, and that's what these standards really, our best practices are really focused on, um, that they, that the recovery house is centered around recovery, has a culture of recovery and is supporting a person no matter where they come from. Um, you know, so just being able to, um, I mean, I would encourage all of you that are on this webinar today to let folks know in your community that this is available on the SAMHSA website. You know, there are probably lots of people out there that may not know who we are at SAMHSA, but we do have these, um, um, you know, um, products that are available to really help help uh, folks stand up these um, services within communities. So that's my charge to all of you that are on this webinar. Thank you. Definitely. And another question for you, Donna, how can someone start a recovery house in their community? Boy, um, yeah, I'm certainly no expert in that. Um, I did work for an agency probably 20 years ago, and we uh, had put together the very first recovery house for women uh, in central Pennsylvania. So that was kind of exciting. But, you know, it's uh, if you look, if you uh, talk to folks at NAR, I think, uh, as well as, you know, all, reach out to the Office of Recovery. Um, you know, there are other people that are kind of experts and check out what's happening within the state. Uh, there may already be a certification process that your state follows. Um, you know, also Oxford House has houses, you know, thousands of people that are in Oxford houses across the country. So there are plenty of models out there. Um, and just focusing, you know, as I said before, our best practices is, is really focused on the social model, um, you know, with the intent of really helping to support people. Uh, I, don't, I don't think you can go wrong. Thank you. And the, this other question is more general, so anyone feel free to answer. Um, an audience member is interested to know how harm reduction fits into this framework and uh, guidance for best practices, um, knowing that recurrence is a part of recovery um, and recovery may not always be linear, um, just how harm reduction tactics fit into this. Lisa, do you want to talk to that with your experience in Florida? I mean, I can, I can, 
certainly would recommend reading the entire report, um, the entire best practices uh, for recovery housing. And um, I would love to hear feedback on that, but I know we continually have conversation in the Office of Recovery around harm reduction and recovery and how that intersects. It's, I was kind of talk, I was doing like a Greg in my head, like it depends on the specific situations. <laughs> um, because harm reduction, speaking of um, like safe um, sterile injection kits and stuff like that is considered harm reduction, but so is like MOUD is considered harm reduction and um, like, you know, you can't, no, there's not, there's not safe injection kits at the recovery residences, but there is Narcan available and they are trained to use it. Um, but that's, that's part of the language issues um, and the should, shalls, nots that make it difficult when crafting these policies that we need to be mindful of. If we want to be supportive and conducive to all and eliminate barriers and not provide any more barriers, but also not harm people in the meantime. Difficult to explain, but. And we'll do one more question before closing remarks. Um, so this is a question about enforcement. So who polices these policies among um, recovery housing and um, who polices these policies among the housing options? I can speak to who enforces the Americans with Disabilities Act, Section 504 and uh, the Fair Housing Act. So there's a number of entities uh, in the federal government, the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Department of Justice all enforce um, all of these statutes, and we have authority to look at pattern or practices. And here, when we're talking about uh, a particular home having a policy, uh, it would likely fall into a pattern or practice. But HUD, uh, their Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, is also a great place to report complaints. And I would suggest that in addition to filing complaints at ada.gov, which is brings you to the Department of Justice, people also file complaints at um, hud.gov, where you can file a complaint through their Office of Fair Housing. And it's possible that if there are grant funds that HHS's Office of Civil Rights uh, may be involved, in which case you can file a complaint at hhs.gov. Now, I will say that in addition to federal enforcement, um, most, if not all states, have analogous uh, state Fair Housing Act and state public accommodation statutes, in which case their state attorney general uh, would likely have an office of civil rights that may investigate such issues. We have that in Massachusetts, both our Massachusetts uh, Attorney General's Office, but also the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination would investigate and could investigate some of these um, these issues. So there's likely a host of issue, a uh, host of enforce, enforcers on these, these um, civil rights statutes that, that I discuss. Um, and anyone, and, and I would frankly say all of them are good places to report to if you have concerns. Um, and, and I would also say, if you also think that practices are particularly predatory, um, that, you know, you report the practices to the local Department of Justice and the U.S. Attorney's Office, because um, beyond civil rights issues, there may be other issues that uh, the, the department may be concerned with. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for your presentations and being open to these questions and this discussion. Um, I will turn it over to Regina for closing remarks. Thanks so much, everyone, for hanging in there uh, and hearing so much uh, about so much content uh, came about. I want to thank Greg and Donna 
and Lissa and Greg and Donna, I think are really emblematic of how important it is that we, um, you know, respect and grow a the public servants in this country because without them, you know, we wouldn't have a lot of the enforcement work that's going on. It just, you know, and and the best practices. So thank you for your service in the federal government and Lissa for your work in Florida to make sure that these life saving services are provided to people. Um, so we will um, have. Have this recording up several asked for it we'll also with the approval of the uh of the uh guest speakers will have their slides available and th those all have contact information in them uh so with that i will wish you all a good day thanks <laughs>